Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. The greatest commandment. If you haven't watched the intro, I encourage you to go watch the intro first. But we're going to reread Luke since we're going to be in Luke. Luke chapter 10 verse... <laughs> Gotta look it up again. Luke 10 27. Luke 10 27. And he answered said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Remember they were asked what was the most important commandment. Okay, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And that's the order we're going to go in. Okay, So we're going to start with heart. And when we did this study we talked about how do you love God? Uh, by keeping his commandments. Where do you get his commandments? Through his word. His perfect word, whether it's the spoken word or whether it's the written word that we're going through today. Okay? It's his perfect written word. So if you will, turn with me to Luke 6.45. And as you're turning to Luke 6.45, I'm going to read from Genesis, a couple things in Genesis. The heart. What we're going to talk about is the heart and how do you love God with all your heart? Why is it important to love God with your heart? and how to love God with all your heart. Okay. So Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wicked of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. Okay. Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savior. This is after the flood. Noah goes out, does, uh, does a sacrifice to the Lord, he smells a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. Now we could go into great detail and talk about Adam and Eve and the fall of man, and how when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the laws of God were put on, the Bible says that the laws of God are written on every man's heart. That's how the laws of God got written on every man's heart. From Adam and Eve on, anyone that's born, the laws of God are written on their heart. But they're also born into a world of sin, a fallen world. Okay. So you say, well, why is that important? Well, let's get us up to Luke 6.45. Luke 6.45 we read, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We've used that in a lot of uh, studies. Okay? Eventually, someone can try to put on a show and they'll say one thing. They'll say good things. Remember the Bible says, by good words and fair speech. is something that sounds fair, that doesn't line up with the Bible, but it sounds fair. Or they'll try to use good things like the Bible. They have good words and fair speeches but they deceive the hearts of the simple. How do they do that? Because they say the right things. But are they doing the right things? No. What they say and what they do are two different things. And eventually, when you back them in a corner, their talking will start lining up with their walking. Out of abundance, abundance. They can say a few things right and put on a show or deceive, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you get them really talking, you back them in the corner, and you show them, hey, your actions don't line up with your words, what's going on here, their words start lining up with their actions. They start doing a 180. Okay. But here what we're holding on to is the treasure. For this study, the treasure. What treasures are you putting in your heart? Okay. What is the number one treasure you are having in your heart? Okay. Is God's word on your lips... Or is it man's words? Your heart is your heart. If you put in God's heart, uh, words in your heart, God's way in your heart, God's commandments in your heart, and living, I always told you that, when you put them in your heart, you're living it. It's not enough to know it, to have the knowledge. I can memorize scripture, brother, it's good to memorize scripture, and you can memorize scripture, but it's not enough to know it, are you living it? When you hide God's Word in your heart, you're living it. That treasure comes out. And you can see what someone truly treasures and what someone, you know, what someone doesn't treasure. 
right? God's way, man's way, the world's way. God's way or the flesh's way. Right? Turn to 1 Corinthians 8.3. We're going to just keep it moving. Pause the video, turn to the passages, but we're going to keep it moving. 1 Corinthians 8.3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Remember, we're going to be quoting that verse a lot. If you're hiding God's word in your heart, it's going to be reflected by the life that you live. If that treasure, this treasure right here, is what you're hiding in your heart, because we read that, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. Okay. If a man love God, oh, I love God, I love God. Everyone always says that. The whole world, in a way, says, I love God, a God, or gods, plural. But by their fruits, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Are they hiding the King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English in their heart and living it? Or they have their own standards, the world standards, me, myself, and I standards. I talked to a brother in Christ and called it, said, I call it the self-entity. The self-entity. Me, myself, and I. You follow the self-entity. There's your gods, plural. Okay? You have people that do that. Okay? And your flesh tries to entice you, brothers and sisters, Christ, into doing that. Following the flesh, putting yourself first, putting someone in the world first, being a respecter of persons. Okay. Compromising to please the flesh. Compromising to please people in the world in the world. Okay. That whole saying, go along to get along. No, we're supposed to be standing firm. And we're supposed to be separate from the world. Get ahead of myself. Okay. Ecclesiastes 8.5. Turn to Ecclesiastes 8.5. Remember, but if a man love God, the same is known of him. It's not about just words. We read that verse, if you watched the intro, about how it's not only them that have the Word of God, but them that do them. They not just hear the Word of God, but do them. Obey it. Those are the ones that are truly of God, following God, in Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior, that are hearing the words of God and doing them. That's what pleases God, not just hearing the Word. That's the first step. But they always ignore the second step, obeying it, doing it. Ecclesiastes 8.5 Whoso keepeth the commandments, the commandment, we'll come back to that, shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. The spiritual discernment today is the Holy Ghost. But you have that, a wise man's heart discerneth. But notice it says in Ecclesiastes, it's the preacher, I love that book, Whoso keepeth the commandment. Now, it could be talking about a specific commandment. You read the whole book and everything. But the commandment shall feel no evil thing. The commandment. It's singular. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus summed it up. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. Love the Lord thy God. The commandment. Now John 16, 13, you have to turn here, but remember, wise man's heart discerneth. In the Old Testament, you had the laws of God that are written on every man's heart. And a wise man was a man that followed, that feared God. Remember, the beginning of wisdom is fearing God. And the last step of wisdom, the, that's the first step, the beginning of wisdom, and the last step is keeping His commandments. If you fear God, you're going to keep His word. If you fear God, you're going to do things His way. That's the result of, of truly fearing God. Someone says, I fear God. Are you doing things God's way? Are you living God's way? Are you keeping His commandments? Well, not the, the, the King James Bible is more like a guideline. That person lied through his teeth. They don't fear God. That's the evidence of fearing God. Okay. That's the beginning of wisdom. But in the Old Testament, they had the laws of God that are written on every man's heart. They had men of God that spoke. Uh, uh, they, 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 were, they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. So God would pick certain men. The Holy Ghost would come down either temporarily or for a while. Uh, remember King David always prayed, uh, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, because you could lose the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. But sometimes the Holy Spirit would come down, God would choose great men and say, listen, I need you to, to speak to the people for me. 
Okay? I'm going to speak to the people through you, in other words. But today we have the Holy Spirit. If you get truly saved and born again, you have the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13, Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of Truth, capitalized Spirit of Truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, whatsoever He shall hear, I always like pointing that out, the Godhead, this is the God, a Godhead verse, it's not a Trinity verse. God the Father is the only true God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. There's but one capital G, God the Father. And God the Father deals with mankind through His Spirit and through His body. Through the Holy Ghost, through the Son of God. Through the Holy Spirit, through the capital S Son of Man. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Okay? He deals with mankind. And I don't, we don't have to get into this too much, just a little side note, but we've, we've done studies on this. Okay, And the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. Okay? Jesus is the angel of the Lord, and when you listen to Jesus and the Gospels, he's saying that, how come you don't know the Father? If I'm doing it, it's God the Father doing it in me. If I'm saying it, it's coming from the Father. Father said it, and I'm just repeating what he told me to say. So when Jesus speaks, it's God the Father speaking. When Jesus heals, it's God the Father healing. And that's how it works. And we get that here with the Holy Spirit. Whatsoever he shall, he shall not speak of himself. Like he's some separate, lowercase g, God the Holy Spirit. He's not. There is no God the Spirit, Holy Spirit. There is no God the Son. There's only God the Father. One God. But some people still refuse to give up the pagan Catholic Trinity, and they love it. Okay? And I always say, chapter and verse and capital T Trinity is a title for God. Chapter and verse and lowercase t Trinity is a description of God. Stop calling yourself a Bible believer then. Because you're not. Now you can be deceived like I was. I'm, I know I'm kind of going off in the side a little bit. Please forgive me, brothers and Christ. But you can be deceived like I was. I use those Trinity terms and everything. But when the knowledge of the truth comes... What treasures are you hiding in your heart? If this is what you're wanting to hide in your heart, this is the treasure, then you're going to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Holy Spirit's in you, and He's going to bring you into all truth. This is the final authority. This is the foundation. That junk ain't in there. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God in three persons, all that junk isn't in here. So what are you hiding in your heart? Is this what you're hiding in your heart? Is this the treasure that you're hiding in your heart? Or is man's wisdom, world's wisdom, paganism in this case, is that what you're hiding in your heart? All right. You know, he doesn't speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, God the Father speaks through the Holy Spirit. That shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. How do we have spiritual discernment today? By the Holy Spirit. We still have the laws of God written on our heart, but we have the Holy Spirit and by God's grace and mercy today, we have the complete Word of God. Perfect written Word of God in English, the King James Bible. You say, why are we going through all that? When we're talking about loving God with your heart. Remember, loving God with your heart? We read that. If a man love me, he will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my words. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. What's the first commandment? obey the gospel and get saved. We're going to get into that more in, uh, when we talk about how to love God with your soul, with all your soul. It's talking about salvation. You have an eternal soul, and if you truly love God, you're going to do things God's way to preserve that soul, where that soul is going to spend eternity. Okay. But that's the next study. But this one, we're going to get into sanctification. Why do we hide God's word in our heart? How do you love God with all, with all your heart? You take God's word, this is the treasure that you're hiding in your heart. You hide God's word in your heart. And you live it. Right? And that leads to sanctification. Right? That leads to, when you get saved, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Psalms 119.11, we read in Psalms 119.11, this is one of the memory verses. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Might not. 
How do we battle that? We read in Genesis 6-5, we read in Genesis 8-21, there's a lot of other places that talks about how man is born into sin, how man's heart, the imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. How do we combat this? Can we overcome this on our own? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Man can try to choose to do good things. We can. That's evidence that God's laws are written on every man's heart when a man chooses to do great things. But we can't overall, overall, overcome our sinful, wicked nature on our own. We need a lot of help. So what does God do? He says, take this, hide it in your heart. Memorize it, hide it in your heart, live it. And that's how you can put the flesh down, that's how you can put... That's how you can keep from sinning. Remember it says that I might not sin against thee. There's still times that we have this in our heart, that we still slip, trip, fall, and oh Lord, and Lord grabs us by the hand and goes, and picks us back up. We repent, we forsake, and we get back to our walk with the Lord. There's times we fall, but our falls will be less. Okay. Psalms 119.9 Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Heed. Obeying God's word. Not just hearing it. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and do them. And do it. Okay? Not just hear, but heed. If I give you advice and you heed my advice, that means you took my advice and applied it to your life. If you're heeding the word of God, you're taking God's word and hiding it in your heart, which means you're applying it to your life, you're living it. Now there's a, there's a saying that my sin will keep me from this book, or this book will keep me from my sin. Where do they get that? Because a lot of people like to have sayings outside the Bible. Where do they get that? Well, they basically got it from the Bible. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How do we get the sin out? How do we keep the flesh in, uh, under control and keep the flesh down? You know, that's wicked. The, the imagination of man's heart is only evil continue. How do you combat that? This right here. Hiding God's word in your heart. Brother, says Christ, it comes down to this again. I'll keep hit, hammering this. Because I love you, and, I love, and, I'm, and it's also a reminder for me. Are you starting your day with the Word of God every day? Are you ending the day with the Word of God? Are you trying to do, like, flashcards. I don't have any of them here with me. But flashcards, these are my uh, hymnals. i put hymns in here. But I got flashcards with memory cards to try and memorize memory verses. Okay. Are you staying in the Word of God daily? Are you praying daily that God helps you to open up, the, helps you by understanding the scriptures and open up the scriptures to you? Is that part of your day-to-day -day walk? Or have you gotten distracted by the world or the flesh and it might have been a few days since you've read the Bible? It might, it might have been a week since you've read the Bible. It might be gathering dust in the corner somewhere. That ain't good. Your flesh doesn't want you reading this book. The world doesn't want you reading this book. But if you're truly saved, your soul, your heart, your mind, your strength, all that you are is desperate for this book, for the Word of God, the King James Bible, for God's perfect written Word in English. You're desperate for God's Word. You want it so much. You want to hide it in your heart and you want to live it. How does a saved sinner love God with all their heart? We just read it, you know, that word have I hid in my heart. We read that loving God, period, just the term loving God without bringing in the heart, the mind, the strength, um, the soul. Loving God has to do with keeping His commandments. It goes hand in hand. You love God, then you keep His commandments. They go hand in hand. And they always try to separate it and make love out to be just a flesh feeling, a burning in the bosom, a flesh feeling, and it's not. Love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will. It's how you treat that person that shows that you love them, not your words, not this feeling that you have inside. It's how you treat them. Do you love God? Are you keeping His commandments? He commands, you obey. Are you doing that?
If you're not, you're not showing love for God. If you reject that premise altogether, then you definitely don't love God at all. Not just lacking some love, because some of us struggle, brothers and Christ, some of us stumble, we fall. Like I said, the flesh gets, gets us to put this down. The world gets us to put this down. Distractions, compromises, sin. That's why we talked about the word, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What are you putting in your heart? It comes back down to that, Brother Christ. What are you putting in your heart? The Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. We always talk about what are you putting before your eyes. Why? Because the Bible talks about the eyes being a door to the soul, to the heart. The images that you put in front of you, they're, they're imprinted on you. And you can, the Word of God can help you put those bad images to the side. But those images are always going to creep up trying to tempt you, trying to mess with you, trying to tempt you to get away from this book. That's why it's important to never have put those images in front of your face to begin with, regardless what it is. Okay? But the same thing here, what are you putting in your heart? When you start putting the world's stuff in your heart, the world's way, traditions of men, the Bible says, spoiled by philosophy. There's some men out there, lost and saved, but mainly it's, talk, it's for... A safe people to warn us not to become like this, but it talks about men getting spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. What happened? They started hiding philosophy in their heart. They started hiding traditions of men trumping the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with having good traditions, brother and sister Christ. There's nothing wrong with it. But no tradition of man should ever, ever trump the Word of God. And yes, I'm going to bring it up. Holidays should never trump the Word of God. And I call them by the what they are. They're not holidays. They're holidays. They should never trump the Word of God. They should never trump your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love for God, because we're talking about loving God with all your heart. Should never trump God and your love for Him, His Word. And it should never trump your love, because remember the second commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. And we learn in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, how to love. It's not just there, but it's really strong there about really emphasize loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Traditions of men, philosophy, rudiments of the world, is that what you're hiding in your heart? Are you hiding God's way in your heart? God's commands in your heart? Something to think about, brothers and sisters Christ. I think a lot of our, we've talked about it, a lot of our disagreements, a lot of our arguments in these last days seem to be based off of philosophy. They're uh, traditions of men. We've always taught it this way. We've always said it this way. Yeah, but does the Bible say it? It doesn't matter what the Bible says. We've always said it this way. There's nothing wrong with saying Trinity because we've always said Trinity. That's tradition. But does that tradition line up with this book? Absolutely not. We've always done this or we've always done that. Our church fathers, you can learn from church fathers absolutely, but you can also get a lot of bad habits from church fathers. And that a lot of bad habits were passed down from church fathers. Battle buildings. We've always done things this way. No, we haven't. You go back to Paul. Paul wasn't doing battle buildings. He wasn't building a business and then yoking it up to the government. And then he wasn't inviting both saved and lost into the fellowship. When he was fellowshipping, it was just saved sinners. When he was evangelizing, it was lost people. There was saved there helping him evangelize to lost people. But when he was preaching the word, it was to save sinners. Other than the gospel. Right? But we've always, you know, they're following church fathers to a certain point and saying, hey, we've always done that. And it's hard to break that, brothers and sisters Christ. It's very hard to break that. To get people back to this, saying this is the final authority, not that man. And the thing that gets me is there's nothing new under the sun. Paul did have that problem, where people are following men, where people are getting into traditions. That's why he had to tell them, you're spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. When you've got people that are following men over following God's word. He said, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus. He's like, was I crucified for you? Did I die for your sins? No. Who are you supposed to be following? Jesus Christ. 
Paul was there to be a light to help you follow Jesus Christ. In the time of the Gentiles, for today, the gospel was revealed to him. But the point is, is what are you hiding in your heart? Paul gets to the point point, says, are you hiding what that man says in your heart? Or if that man says this, like if they're quoting scripture, or you're getting into the Bible, there's some brethren that will copy, I'm, I'm going to go off just a little bit. There's some brethren that they will copy what some guy says, and he'll quote some verses, but they'll copy what he says and just pair it. Remember we talked about before in the past? We haven't mentioned this in a while, but PWCs. Polly want a cracker. They're just parrots. That man said it, it sounded good. He quoted some scripture and it sounded good. So I'm just going to pair it with that man said. Did you actually do the study for yourself? Well, no, I just don't have time. And, and you know, and, and I really don't need to because, you know, when Paul told the Bereans about Jesus Christ, about the true plan of salvation, you know what they did? Well, Paul's a good man. I mean, he's a good man. I mean, look at all his credentials. Remember Paul talked about all his credentials and he counted them all but dumb? But look at all his credentials. I mean, this is a great man. We'll just take his word for it. No, what they did was they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. And brethren, you need to get back in the habit of church, searching the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. Even if I'm preaching and teaching, you need to do the study for yourself. You need to stay in the Word of God daily. We have it abundantly. I said before, I was one, maybe I'll do the video if I keep talking about it, but I want to put all the Bibles up. There was a time when Bibles were very rare. Okay, Household might have had one Bible, if that. The preacher had the Bible. People went to listen to the preacher read the Bible because that was the only way to hear the Word of God. Because not everybody had Bibles. But today, my house, I'm a collector of Bibles. I have tons of Bibles. There's tons of Bibles out there. There's tons of, uh, there's still uh, the two, there's local church Bible publishers, and then there's Bible publishers that you can get a King James Bible. You can get a King James Bible for cheap. I think it was like 10 bucks. Right. That doesn't include shipping and handling, but it's 10 bucks. You can still get Bibles today. You can get the Word of God today. Today, mankind today, brothers and sisters in Christ out there today, you're without excuse. You're completely without excuse to not look it up and be like the Bereans and say, is this right? There was a time where it's like, okay, Lord, you pray to the Lord, and the Lord, if the family had one Bible, you had to take turns reading it, or you had to go listen to the preacher preach, and you'd pray to the Lord about something, and you'd go sit down, and the Holy Spirit would get that preacher to preach on something that had to do with what you were talking to the Lord about, and would answer your question. But today, you have the Holy Spirit, you did then, but you also have the whole Word of God in your hands. What are you hiding in your heart, brothers and sisters of Christ? Are you hiding God's Word in your heart? Remember to follow 2 Timothy 2.15. We talked about that, rightly dividing. But are you hiding God's Word in your heart? Are you starting to be deceived into hiding traditions of men in your heart? Rudiments of the world. I know some men that are supposed to be Bible believers defending the Bible, but they are spoiled by philosophy. They bring philosophy into it a lot. Those men are spoiled. Okay. Are you hiding philosophy in your heart? Man's wisdoms. When you have a man that won't say things the Bible way a lot, they tend to throw out man's phrases. I, I threw out one, and there's nothing wrong with it a little bit, but if that's primarily all they do, and they hardly quote it from the Scriptures, uh, Either this book, talking about the King James Bible, either this book will keep me from my sins, or my sins will keep me from this book. The Bible says, if they say that, and then they say, the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee, then you're dealing with a good man. But if they ignore the scriptures and keep quoting man's phrases, worldly wisdom, with the, man's phrases, what they're doing is they're getting you away from this book, and they're getting too much into philosophy. Be careful about that. This book is the foundation, not philosophy, not world's wisdom. We've talked about that before. What are you putting in your heart? God's word or man's words? 1 Corinthians 8, 3 again, you don't have to turn here. It says, but if a man love God, the same is known of him. If a man love God, the same is known of him. You can tell if a man loves God by what, what's he hiding in his heart. I've gotten into it with some brethren and disagreements of the Bible. We have disagreements of the Bible. But I get into it with Bible perversionists. 
I get into it with Catholics, false religions, Mormons, uh, Jehovah's Witness, out here in the real world. They, they would be caught dead uh, making a comment underneath one of these videos, but I, I deal with them, and it's like, they don't love God. They don't. They love their traditions of man. They love their clubhouse. They love their, their cult they're a part of. And the leaders of the, that occult is what they love. They don't love God. They don't love God at all. The life you live and what you stand for, how you treat this book and handle this book, will tell you if you love God. Will tell me if you love God. And the way I, I know I'm pointing this at you, brothers of Christ, but let's, let's bring it back on me. How I handle the Word of God. The Bible talks about uh, not handling the Word of God deceitfully. Not wrestling the Scriptures to your own destruction. Okay? There's times where I wasn't purposely doing either of those, but I was wrong. I can still be wrong. There, I, I, I'll keep telling this story because I don't want people thinking that I'm acting like I'm always right. Because some men get so high of them, they start thinking more high. The Bible talks about they, these men think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. And when I think of Paul, I think, is that what he struggled with? Trying to let go of his past? All his credentials? He was, the Pharise he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he had all this, this study, all these PhDs. T today it would be called PhDs, THDs, doctorates and everything. He had a hard time letting go of that and having the attitude that, you know, I know it all. He had to come to God to the point where saying, I know nothing. Lord, show me. That's someone God can deal with. Lord, I don't know anything. Show me. Now, I'm not saying that right now what I do is when I come to a, something that seems to stump me or I can't figure it out, I have to come to God and go, I know nothing. Lord, I can't get it. I can't figure it out. I've had to do that before. I don't know. I, I, I just don't know, Lord. I don't know. And the Lord will show it to you. Okay. But what are you hiding in your heart? Right? If a man love God, the same is known of him. The same is known of him. It'll come out how you live your life. And that scares people today. That's why the number one uh, easy believism, the, the number one false gospel today, believe it or not, it's not workspace based You have your cults like Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, cult, uh, Catholicism, the Catholic Church, Catholicism, that tries to push that you can't know that you're saved and that you have to earn salvation. And they put... They fear monger and put fear to keep the laity down, like the Nicolaitans, to keep the laity down. But the number one gospel today in the world that seems to be the most false gospel, that seems to be the most popular, is easy believism. Faith alone. And we go chapter verse where it says faith alone. We'll say it again in the book of Hebrews. It's the only time the word faith and the word alone is together in one verse. And it says faith without works is dead being alone. In other words, there's evidence of faith. And what this movement is 100% against is evidence of that faith. Proving themselves. The changed life. They're against the changed life. Oh, the changed life's just going from unbelief to belief. No, the changed life is sanctification. Remember, we read about that. Those that are in Christ Jesus, He has made us unto wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. So that He that glory, let Him glory in the Lord. That's the new birth. Sanctification is part of it. Wisdom. What's the beginning of wisdom? Fearing God. I'm telling you right now, Almost everyone I come across that's part of the easy believe is movement, they do not fear God. When push comes to shove and you back them into a corner that, hey, they're doing wrong by God, their gospel's wrong, their life is wrong, you're not obeying the word of God, you're still just looking like the world, acting like the world, living like the world, they mock God, they mock you, they mock me, they mock God, and they just go about doing whatever they want to do. That's just your interpretation, blah, 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 blah. They don't care. They don't fear God. They don't have that wisdom. That righteousness. That you look at, start looking at the Jesus Christ they follow. It's not the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. It's an antichrist. That antichrist spirit that's in the world today. Sanctification, it's not there. Yeah, they'll give up some bad things that the 
community, the world traditions of men says is bad, oh, then I'll give it up so I can be part of my group. But they're not giving it up for the Lord because the Lord says it's wrong. Because there's a lot of things in their life they still haven't given up because the traditions of men, the community, the world says it's okay. But God's Word says it's not. But the world, and they still do it. And that's how you can see right through them. The sanctification isn't by the Word of God. The sanctification is by the Word of men. Well, they said it's wrong, and I, and I want to be part of them, so I'll give it up to be part of them, and just to go along to get along. But they said I didn't have to give up this. And they said I didn't have to give up that. They're not the final authority. This is. God is. What did God say? Right. Now, we're going to go back to how uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, 9. Now, we already read, how do you love God with all your heart? How do you love, with, how, how do you love God? You keep His commandment. How do you love God with all your heart? You hide God's Word in your heart. And you live it. You're hiding it in your heart, and you're living it. You're doing it. You're obeying it. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. This is another reason why people don't like a, a final authority. A King James Bible being God's final authority. This being the standard. The easy believism. I'm telling you right, most of the easy believism don't like the King James Bible. And the ones who claim to use a King James Bible and be Bible believers, they're not. They're not. They'll still correct this book. They'll still tear down this book. They'll still ignore this book so they can have with, and live how they want to live. But Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God. And he tells us through his perfect written word. Spoken word or written word. But God. Who can know it? God knows man's heart. And I didn't put this in my notes, but you read about Jesus and the Gospels. He could always hear what people were saying in their hearts. He knew and could see what was on men's hearts. Who can know it? God knows it. And He reveals it through His Word. This book. Why do they hate a final authority? Is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Because this pierces right through them. It pierced through me. When I truly got saved and born again, truly got saved and born again, I learned the Bible, my testimony, I learned the Bible version issue. And I heard the Gospel, the true plan of salvation, Repentance towards God. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. What do you read there? In a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? People of the world, the sorrow of the world is, I don't want to conform to this book. I don't want to give up my sin. My sin isn't that bad. I don't care about the consequences, or I don't believe what you say the consequences are. I love, I, I'm just, I'm too sorrowful to give that up. And yet, someone who truly gets saved, true biblical repentance is godly sorrow. Coming to God saying, I don't care. At first, you're like, I'm wrong. You have to come to Him and say, I'm wrong. You're right, Lord. I'm worthless. You're, you're, you're everything. You, you're the greatest treasure. I'm worthless. Okay. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. You're holy. Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. Godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him, and you bring those sins to the cross. You're not giving up those sins like you're cleaning up your life and then getting saved, but you're throwing those sins at the, at the foot of the cross saying, yes, I'm sinful and wicked, and I have sorrow for these sins. Lord, I am so sorry for sinning against you. And you throw those sins at the foot of the cross. What's the cross? That's the second step. 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? How he, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, how he died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. His blood is God's blood and it was shed to pay for our sins. And he died and rose again the third day proving that he's God the Father manifest in the flesh. He's the body of God. The blood that was shed was God's blood. The next step, confess both in prayer. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession. What are you confessing? Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, O Lord. I deserve it. I don't want to go to hell. Lord, what can I do? I don't want to go to hell, but I deserve to go to hell, Lord, and I am so sorry. Lord, I believe in Jesus Christ, your Son, that He died on the cross. That blood is your blood, O Lord, and He died for my sins, and that blood can wash my sins away. And did wash my sins away. O oh Lord. And then you get to the last step. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, please save me. I don't deserve it. Lord, please save me. Why is that so hard for people? None of that is a physical work. It's all happening here and confession. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's still all coming from here. Why is that so hard for people? Because that gospel, the true gospel, leads to a changed life after salvation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The old man is dead and buried with Christ. That's why when we read that verse when Jesus says there's no greater love than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. People love reading that. See, Jesus loved me so much he gave his life for me. But they don't like to keep reading. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So the greatest love is sacrificing your life for somebody. And Jesus says, well, if you guys are my friends, then you sacrificed your life for me. Did you give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross? My life is yours. Take this wicked, wicked man. You go on one side, wicked, dirty, rotten, filthy man, and you come out the other side, a new creature. Clean. Your sins are washed away. God sets you on a different path now. Not the path of the world, not the spirit of the world that we talked about. But he sets you on a new path. And that new path leads to wis true wisdom, fearing God, and keeping his commandments. Sanctification, cleaning up your life. God's righteousness, you represent Jesus Christ, you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. His righteousness is imputed to us. We are uh, the ministry of reconciliation and redemption. What motivates us to do the first three more than anything is redemption, that Jesus could come back any day to call us home. We need to get busy living for the Lord. And the lost world hates that. That's why this easy believism is so popular. It destroys all of that. No fear of God. You don't have to keep His count. You should, but you don't have to. We don't preach you have to when they should be preaching. Brother and sister Christ, like I preach, you have to. And when you fail the Lord, what do you do? You, you repent. You ask God for forgiveness. God gives you the strength to forsake. He grabs you by the hand, picks you back up, and gets you going again. But this is God's command. It's not a choice. Brother Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be doing this. Do I fail the Lord sometimes? Yes. I know we all have. But my heart, my attitude is, is I'm trying my best to do what God commands and to do things God's way. And our heartfelt attitude is when we fail, we repent, we forsake, and we get back to our walk with the Lord. No matter how far you've fallen, God will pick you back up and get you going again. You have to repent and forsake. The, war, the, lost, the easy believism, the lost world, they don't like that. They don't like the true plan of salvation. They don't. They don't want the changed life. They have sorrows of the world. Remember what we said, read? So, well, I, I said the sorrows of the world worketh death. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Worldly sorrow doesn't work true repentance. 
There's some people that are sorry for the consequences. They're sorry about hell, going to hell, but they're not sorry to the man that can send them to hell. They don't want to go to hell. Anybody in their right mind, and a lot of people these days aren't in their right mind. I told you about the one guy. <laughs> I'm going to hell, yeah. I, and I told him, but you don't have to go. You know, you can choose to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. No, I choose to go to hell. Some people are just out of their mind. And I don't believe that person actually believes in hell because the real hell, if he knew what hell was really like, he'd never choose to go there. Nobody would choose to go to hell if they truly believed it existed and what it was really like. Nobody would choose to go there. Everyone that's in hell right now would say, I would, should have never, I would never have chosen to come here if I'd known hell was like this. I never would have chosen to come here. Okay. But who can know it? Let's get back to this. Who can know it? God does. We hide God's word in our heart because it helps us with our changed life. It helps us to please God and not please our flesh and not please the world. It keeps us from conforming to the world. We'll get to those verses later. And loving the world. It helps us combat sin, wickedness, and evil. It helps us combat the three enemies. The flesh, the world, and Satan. It helps us stay in line with God. 2 Corinthians 6.17 2 Corinthians 6.17 Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Come out from among them. This separates me from the rest of the world. And brothers and sisters Christ, if you're truly saved and born again, we're brothers and sisters Christ. We're part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. We're part of a family. We together are separate from this wicked world. That's why they don't want a final authority. People who attack this is they don't want to be separate from the world. They attack the King James Bible. They don't want to be separate from it. They don't want a final authority. The easy believism, the reason they attack us and say, they're teaching works-based salvation. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're, te we're, te we're teaching that faith without works is dead being alone. You get saved by God's grace. It's never faith alone. It's never faith alone. It's through faith. But you're saved by God's grace alone. I remember we got into some, some of the comments with some of these guys. They're like, uh, faith alone, faith alone. It's like, uh, no, we show them the scriptures. Ephesians 2, 8, we also throw in 9. Uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we throw in verse 10. And we say, it says, for by grace are you saved. Grace. It's grace alone. Only God can save. It's grace. When you say faith alone, you're turning it into something that you're doing that saved you. Oh, that's not true. Yes, it is. I get hammered by that all the time. It's through faith. How do you find God's grace? God dispenses His grace differently throughout the whole Bible. From Adam and Eve through to um, the, the day of the Lord. God dispenses His grace differently. But it's always God's grace that saves mankind. It's always God that does the saving. And it's through faith. No, no, blah, blah, blah. My faith didn't earn me salvation. It was still a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, stop turning faith into works, not of yourselves. It's God's grace that saves. Not of yourselves. It is a gift. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. It's the gift of God, not of works. And be careful with that one, because they'll try to make the simplest things like speaking. Breathing is a work. Breathing is a work. Opening your eyes is a work. No, the Bible talks about what is works. When you try to go through the Levitical laws in order to be saved, that's works. But prayer is not a work. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Praying, confessing to God your repentance and your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and asking God to save you is not a work. That's satanic. That's Satanism at its finest. Perverting what the truth is. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, my faith, I've got such great faith. Faith alone, faith alone. Lest any man should boast. I did nothing. It was God. God saved me. He did it all. It was by God's grace and mercy 
and his love wherewith he loved us at the cross. You get saved, he present tense loves you. You're lost, that love is at the cross. You've got to go to the cross. All right. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And verse 10 says, For we, are, we, those who get saved, who find his grace through faith, no works, for we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. Faith without works is dead, being alone. True faith, there's going to be evidence of true faith. And what's the evidence of the true faith? What are you hiding in your heart? What treasure are you hiding in your heart? Are you loving God with all your heart? Are you? They don't like that. They hate that. But more than anything, they line up with the world. More than anything, they don't line up with this book. That's why we read 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, the two things that keep you from loving God's Word, I said two things, but then God corrected me on my notes. It's like, actually, remember the three enemies. But I put here the two things that are keeping, me, uh, keeping man from loving God with all their heart is the flesh and the world. But don't, don't you dare forget about Satan, the three enemies. The flesh, the world, and Satan. Yea, hath God said. Is there really a perfect written Word of God today? I know God said heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Yeah. He said it three times in the four Gospels, but, you know, yea, hath God said? That's Satan. That's satanic. There is no perfect written word of God. Then you're on Satan's side. You want to be the final authority. The flesh, the enemy. You become an enemy of God because you want to be the final authority. Not the word of God. Well, I prefer... I prefer the ESV, or I prefer the NIV. So you are an enemy of God because you are trying to be the foundation instead of God's Word. You're saying, yea, hath God said. I will decide what God says and what He doesn't say. We have a final authority, brothers and Christ. Praise God. I thank God. Hopefully you are too, brothers and Christ. I thank God every day for His Word, for showing me the Bible version issue, for showing me the true plan of salvation, for saving me, for getting me back on the right path. Through his word, for giving me his word to read every day. Romans 12, 2. I'm sorry. Uh, 1 Corinthians, skip to first. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Spirit of the world? You read that in 1 John. I think it's 1 John or 2 John where it talks about the Antichrist, that, that spirit is already in the world today. That Antichrist spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit or do you have the spirit of the world? I deal with a lot of people. I'm not pushing you, brother. I'm saying we deal with people that profess Christianity left and right all around us. But when we look at them, do they have the spirit of the world? Or do they have the spirit which is of God? Now we, those who are saved, have received... Not the spirit of the world. All these false converts out there. These wolves in sheep's clothing. These goats pretending to be sheep. Wolves pretending to be sheep. But there's goats out there saying, I'm a sheep. I'm a sheep. I'm one of you. They're goats. And the reason I say that is you read about, I've been reading about uh, in um, Matthew. I'm almost done with Matthew. Where Jesus is prophesying the day of, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble into the day of the Lord, and he sets the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. Let's see, my right. Sheep on the right hand. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta go like this. Okay, that's L. Uh, sheep on the right hand, goats on the left, and the goats go into hell. All right? But these goats say, Oh, I'm a sheep. I'm one of you. What spirit do they have? What's their attitude towards God's perfect written word? that we're supposed to hide in our heart. That's how we love God with all our heart. What's their attitude? Oh, there is no perfect written word of God. Oh, that's just your false religion. That's just your belief. That's just your interpretation. The Bible says that no scripture is of any private interpretation. There is no, well, you can believe your way and I can believe my way. Uh -uh, that doesn't fly. Not in the Bible. 
not with, Paul, not with Jesus, not with Paul, not with Titus, not with Silas, not with any of them. Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh-uh. And I go back to Jesus, the final authority, God, the final authority. That's not okay with God. There is no private interpretation. You can't believe something different than me. We need to be lined up. The Bible, we talk about that all the time, that we need to be of, of the same mind and of the same judgment, Paul says. But today, what's popular is that we can all believe whatever we want to believe, and we can just come together and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. But what is that? In order to believe that, what do you got to do? That's what you got to do in order to believe that. Someone who's, who's, who has a love and hiding God's word in heart, oh no, there's a truth. And we all need to line up with this truth. I might be wrong sometimes, and I get corrected. You might be wrong, brother, says Christ, sometimes, and you get corrected. But in the end, we all need to line up with this. Final authority. That's what the world hates. They hate it with a passion. What spirit do they have? All right. Spirit of the world or the spirit of God? Someone who loves the truth, studies the Bible version issue out. Most people that I talk to about that use NIVs, NASVs, they have not studied the Bible version issue. They haven't studied it. They listen to some guy who hates the King James Bible, and all he does is attack the King James Bible. They don't actually do the full-on study of the Bible version issue. They don't have the Spirit of God in them. They have the Spirit of the world in them. Remember what it talks about? The world heareth them. They speak, they, they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. The Spirit of the world. Romans 12, 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're not to conform to this world. When you see people that are hardcore conformity, I doubt their salvation big time. I, I look at them and say, that's more of the spirit of the world, not the spirit uh, which is of God. That's the spirit of the world. Can we compromise sometime? Get scared and compromise. Like I said, we can fail the Lord. But our whole life is not going to be 100% conformity. We might do it a little bit here or there, or fail the Lord here or fail the Lord there, but someone who's truly saved, God's going to help get you back on your feet, brother and sister Christ. You're not going to look 100% like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, laugh at the world's jokes. There's people out there, and I was one of them before I got truly saved, that we were all about conformity. We, kept, we, we say we're, we're separate from the world. You know, I'm, I'm not of the world. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. But you look at us, we are in the world and of the world. We were conforming. We look more like lost people than we did, you know, being separate. We got along with lost people, hand in hand. Our music started, our so-called worship music became like lost people's. Our, how we dressed became like lost people. Men started having long hair. Women started wearing pants. We started doing things that... Be not conformed. Oh, you're not supposed to judge. You're not supposed to judge. Yes, we are. Those of us who are truly saved, and this is our final authority, and we have the wisdom of God. What's the wisdom? Fearing God first. And that heartfelt desire, because we fear God, our heartfelt desire is to do things His way and keep His commandments. We have a right to look and judge and say, wait a second, something's not right here. These people are all professing a Christianity, but they're no different than a Satanist. In the end, they're no different than a Satanist. They're very worldly. The lives that they live is very wicked and sinful. And God-hating, God-word-hating. They hate God's Word. They hate the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They hate the true plan of salvation of the King James Bible. They hate everything about God and His Word. But they have a profession of faith. What spirit do they have? 1 John 2.15 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's just straight out. There is no, well, maybe. No. Any man that loves the world, the spirit of the world, the ways of the world when it goes against the Bible. Okay? I heard a brother teach once that what it meant was you can love things in this world like a pizza, 
And he starts grabbing little things like that, but you can't love anything more than you love God. What this is talking about is when it comes to, there's a war going on between the world and God. Between the flesh and God. Between Satan and God. Satan and his children, you know, that transform themselves into an angel of light. And their ends are according to their works because they're lost and they're on their way to hell. So it says that, are you loving these three things more than you love God? Or not more, or are you loving God? Not more. You shouldn't love them at all. You should love God. What's loving God? Hiding His Word in your heart and living it. You're not to love this world. Now you go back, oh, my favorite color is green. I love the color green. I love going for walks and stuff like that. That's not what this is talking about. You might love a pizza. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about when the world comes in and says, hey, you've got to make a choice. It's either God or the world. God or the flesh. God or Satan, who's the lowercase g God of this world. Which one are you going to love? If you choose any of this crap... Oh, sorry, forgive me. Forgive me. Lord, please forgive me. If you choose any of this stuff over here... If you choose any of this stuff over here, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's not someone who's saved. They still need to get saved and born again. They need to come over here and say, Lord, I choose you, and I'm going to love you with the life that I live. After salvation, the life that I live, I choose you. Can brethren fail the falling away? Can the brethren start shifting over to this side? Yes, yes, I believe they can. But there's going to be evidence of salvation and evidence of a falling away. There's no evidence of salvation. There's no evidence of a changed life. There is no falling away. You never got saved. You're over there on that side. I get so frustrated, brothers and sisters. Please forgive me. I get so frustrated. I lost my daughter to the world and I lost her in death. I lost my ex-wife. I lost my wife to the world. Well, she was already of the world. But she refused to get truly saved and born again. She refused to give her life fully and completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have family members. Uh, my mother and my, my stepdad, my dad died when I was two years old, committed suicide. And my stepdad and my mom, I'm not allowed to talk about the Word of God to them. They don't want this. They don't want God's Word. They don't want the true plan of salvation. They got Bible perversions. Uh, feminist Bible perversions and they go to a Bible building that they picked out that tells them what they want to hear they don't want truth they still look like the world and act like the world they love things that I even point out I I got to the point where we don't really talk much because I point out to them some of the things like movies she's a movie person she loves watching all these Hollywood movies and TV shows it's like I point out how sinful and wicked they are how they attack God how they mock God I thought you said you were a Christian and they don't like that. They just assist me. We can't talk about that at all, period. That's her solution. We just, we just can't talk about it. We can't talk about Jesus Christ. We can't talk about heaven or hell. We can't talk about sin. What, what's keeping her from getting saved? Loving the world. The sorrows of the world worketh death. The sorrows of the world worketh death. And I know, brothers and sisters Christ, I'm not the only one going through this. People around you that you love and you care about, and no matter what you say, no matter what you do, you're still supposed to be a light and still live right. It is important to live right and do right by God. Do things His way, live His way, do right. But it just seems like you can't reach them. It always comes down to this, but this is Christ. You can't save somebody who doesn't want to save, want to be saved. And God, I'm not saying that I could save him, but you can't lead a you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You remember that saying? But the Bible talks about people with hard hearts. Okay, uh, they have not all obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. They want to be lost. God will not save anybody who doesn't truly want to be saved. He won't. We cannot. I was about to say we can't save. I can't save anybody when it comes to helping people out down here. If somebody doesn't want help, you can't help them. When it comes to true biblical salvation, I can't lead someone to Jesus Christ that doesn't want Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ. 
I can't lead someone to salvation who's still holding and clinging to this world like it's life and death. The love of the world. Love not the world. Conform not to the world. Be not conformed to the world. Okay? You can't help them. What are they hiding in their heart? What treasure are you hiding in your heart? It comes back to, we can't help them. They don't want to get saved. So the only thing I can do is, number one, work on my walk with the Lord. Make sure that I'm hiding the real treasure in my heart. Then I can encourage and exhort the brethren. You, brother, says Christ, what are you hiding in your heart? Are you hiding this in your heart? Make sure you are. Make sure you live in God's way. Make sure you're fearing Him and doing things His way. Obeying His word. Make sure you're rightly dividing. Because some people will make a mess of the scriptures by not rightly dividing. Do we do animal sacrifices today? No. Is there a tree with fruit on it of the knowledge of good and evil that we're not supposed to eat? Is that for today? No. Okay. We have to rightly divide. Pauline epistles is primarily what you're going to find how we're supposed to live today in the time of the Gentiles. The true plan of salvation. The changed life. Living a life of Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. We're eternally secure today. That there's dispensations, which is why the Pauline epistles show how we're supposed to live. We can learn from everywhere else in the Bible, and sometimes uh, there's things that overlap. That the Pauline epistles mentions, but it also mentions in the Gospel. There's things that overlap. Okay, we're not, we're not to bear false witness today. Well, that was in the Old Testament too. There's things that overlap, but we have to be careful and follow 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing. Right. How can you tell someone who has the Spirit of God versus the Spirit of the world? Do they conform to the world? Do they love the world? Or what are they hiding in their heart? Are they hiding God's Word in their heart? Or does it seem like they're hiding me, myself, and I in their heart? I feel, my opinion is, I've been told something I want to hear, so I'm going to go with it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. You no longer conform to the world. You no longer love the world. You no longer love the flesh. You no longer love the world. And in contrast, who's the lowercase g God of the world? You're no longer serving Satan. You have a new master now that you're saved. And it's Jesus Christ. My Lord and Savior, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All things become new. How you look at everything changes. When you look at something, you look at it through this. Lord, is that right? Lord, is that wrong? Should I do this, Lord? Should I be doing this? We look at everything through this lens, if you want to say it, like, like glasses, through this lens, through the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God. All things become new. When I truly got saved and born again, and God showed me this book, and I started really studying it, I realized I knew I was wicked, but boy, this book showed me just how wicked I was. How much cleaning up needed to be done. I knew that I was wrong, the false religions, they taught me some wrong things. But this book showed me how wrong and showed me so much that they weren't telling me. I learned so much. The first year I was a Bible believer, a King James Bible believer, following good Bible believing ministries. Than I ever did in my whole life. Because, you know, when you're raised in the Babel building system, my whole life in the Babel building system. Behold, all things become new. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh. Ye are not in the flesh, brothers and sisters. But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If so be that the Because if the Spirit of God is not dwelling in you, what spirit do you have? The Spirit of the world. That Antichrist spirit. You can't have both. You can only have the Holy Spirit, or you can have the Spirit of the world. And people have to choose. Get truly saved and born again. We told the gospel, the true plan of salvation. Or reject it, so you can have the Spirit of the world. 
But ye are not in the flesh. Now, if you read the whole chapter of Romans 8, we did a huge study on this where people were come. These, one of the things that these easy believism and these battle buildings love to push is carnality. Carnal Christians, carnal Christians. Okay, there's some preachers out there that preach that when it says carnally minded walking after the flesh and spiritually minded walking after the flesh, these are just two types of Christians. No, it isn't. That's a lie. This is Paul saying, this is someone who's lost, this is someone who's saved. Can someone who's saved start backtracking a little bit? Absolutely. But in that context of chapter 8, it's contrasting someone who's lost versus someone who's saved. Which are you? But ye are not in the flesh, so you're not carnally minded and walking after the flesh if you're truly saved and born again. Ye are not in the flesh, but in the capital S, Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. How can you tell if someone has the Holy Spirit versus someone who's lost? First of all, we read this book has its number. We use this book to judge people, but are they, do they have the Spirit of the world? Are they doing things the world's way? Is the world's way the final authority? They can fail. We fail. But I'll say it like this. Is the, lost, is the world the final authority? Or is this? Is your flesh the final authority? Or is this? Or Satan in his ways, perverting the word of God? Is that your final authority? Yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be. Well, my interpretation, I feel, is Satan's way your final authority? Or is God's way your final authority? But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So be that the spirit... Of of God dwelling in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Brother says, Christ, how do you love God? Uh, this is how you know someone loves God with all their heart. Is this what they're putting in their heart and living? Doing their best to live. You can see struggling. You have some grace for brethren that are struggling. Absolutely. But I come across people that they're so firm that there's nothing wrong with my sin. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. How dare you judge me? And you know, that book is more of a guideline. And they start attacking this book when you're pointing out their sin. Instead of them, instead of them coming broken and beating themselves and coming broken and saying, you're right, this is sin, this is wickedness, they start attacking this book so they can have their way of life. The world, the sorrows of the world, the spirit of the world. Now we start in 1 Corinthians 2, 12. It says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Let's continue. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. That we might know the things that are freely given to us, which things also we speak. What's been get freely given to us? What treasure you hide in your heart? Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. What's the natural man? He still has the Spirit of the world. We read about the natural man. That you're born into sin and that the imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. The natural man is carnally minded and walking after the flesh. In Romans chapter 8. Carnally minded and walking after the flesh. The flesh is the foundation. The world is the foundation. And by contrast, Satan can come in and start being the foundation. And manipulating those kind of people. And using lost people. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. What is the natural man? A man in his lost state. We says, remember Genesis 6, 5, 8, 21. Man's heart is evil from his youth. The imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. Psalms 39, 5 says, Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Salah. Vanity. The natural man is vanity. We need Jesus Christ. We need to hide His Word in our heart. We need salvation first and foremost. And after salvation, you need God's Word in your heart. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit and stay in the Word of God every day, brothers and sisters Christ, every day. 
Let's continue in 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14, For they are foolishness unto him, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. This is foolishness to him, for they are foolishness unto him. How many of us get mocked for being Bible believers, brothers and sisters Christ? How many of us get mocked for this is the final authority of what's right and wrong? God's the final authority. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Have you ever had someone who professes to be a Christian try to tell you what God says when he wants, and they talk, 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 and I'm exaggerating, but let's say an hour later, they haven't mentioned any scripture. It's all man's talk. They're just talking man's wisdom, man's feelings, opinion, and you're sitting there going, not once did they quote scripture. Not once did they come back to the final authority. It's just all feelings and opinions. Neither can ye know them because they are spiritually discerned. Lost people can't get this book. They can read it. They can PWC. I've been deceived by people pretending to be brethren. I've been deceived because they parroted what Peter Ruckman said, Brian Denlinger said, uh, David Daniels said, Sam Gibbs said, uh, 33rd Book said, or whoever you're watching that is a good Bible believer. You can have lost people watch these men, even me, watch these men of God, and they compare it with what that person says, and it makes them look like they're saved. But you get them down, and you get them down, and you talk to them and have a Bible study that's just a one-on-one -on -one Bible study, how does it go? They're clueless. I've come across them. They're, up, uh, they're completely clueless. Why? They don't have the Holy Spirit in them, that spiritual discernment. All they know is how to copy people. Okay? Because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. That's why we're allowed to judge. But he that is spiritual, when this is the final authority, the Holy Spirit opens this to us, this is the final authority, we can judge. When someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit, this isn't their final authority, they can't judge. They have no right to judge. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. How does someone have the mind of Christ? Salvation first. Absolutely. We're going to get to that when we talk about um, loving God with all your soul. But salvation first, then hiding God's word in your heart and living it. The Holy Spirit comes in, opens this book, and says, this is how God... This is what pleases God. This is what doesn't please God. This is how God does things. This is who God is. This is how He acts. He's slow to anger. He's vengeful. He can pour out His wrath. He has love. He has grace. He has mercy. And it goes through and talks about everything that God is. How God does things. And sometimes we don't get told the why on everything, but every once in a while, God does give us a why, which is pretty neat. Not just neat, but it's amazing that God would let us know, because we don't need to know the why. He's God. But there's times where God does let us know why. Right. Today, people are going after feelings and opinions when it comes to absolute truth, and man's words, and the world's words, and the world's way, and man's way, flesh's way, is what's reigning in their hearts. And that's what we're dealing with today, brothers and Christ. We're trying to preach truth to them, and they're, they're kicking us away. They don't want the truth. They don't want the truth. And the number one thi thing that they're really attacking is not you, brothers and Christ. They're attacking God's Word. So don't lose that strength and that faith and that stand of standing for God's Word. Don't faint, don't falter, because you think they're attacking you. I'm just being attacked. I get into that sometimes. I'm just being attacked. Remember what Jesus said, if they hate you, don't worry. They hated me first. And it's not you that they hate. It's me. Not me, but Jesus Christ. They hate the real Jesus Christ, and they hate God's Word. They're not attacking you. This is what they're attacking. This is what's under attack, hardcore in the world today. This right here. And now I've heard Bible perversionists. I've heard uh, Catholics are now saying that they're Bible believers. No matter what term, just a little side note, no matter what term we try to come up with, we're, we're real Christians. Okay, we should stop using the term Christians. We should start saying Bible believers. 
whatever term we can come up with, they're going to steal it to copy us and be a, a false convert, or how do you say, uh, to deceive, to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay? They're going to do whatever they can. They're always going to steal it. They're calling themselves, the Catholics are not Bible believers. Okay? Uh, Orthodox Jews aren't Bible believers. I heard an Orthodox Jew say that, well, well I, I, you know, we're, and he said we, and he was clearly including themselves in all these religions, and it's like, we are Bible believers. It's like, that one world religion is already here, brother, says Christ. That's a whole other subject, but what's under attack right now is the Word of God. Like I said, I talked to some Bible perversionists. Well, the King James Bible is a great translation, translation however... But, I prefer the ESV. You just lied. You just lied. And you were taught to lie. You don't think the King James Bible is a good translation, because if you did, you'd use it. I don't think the ESV is a good translation. I don't think any of the Bible perversions are a good translation. They're all horrid, satanic, wicked. And I don't prefer the King James Bible. I've done the study... And, the, and got saved, and the Holy Spirit, through, through studying the issue, says, this is it. This is God's perfect written word. You know what they say? Well, the Holy Spirit in me says it's not. We can use it. No, that's the world, the spirit of the world, that's telling you you can use any book you want. That's that spirit of Antichrist that's telling you you can use any book you want. That you are the final authority. Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. A better rendering would be, you can be the final authority. Right. We're going to wrap this up. It's a few verses we're going to go through real quick. Warning after we finish heart, the study. There was a warning that God put on my heart when we put in here. We teach the Word of God as God's perfect written Word. What's one of Satan's tactics? We've already talked about it. There, there's an attack on this book, so you don't hide this word, God's Word in your heart. True love for Jesus Christ, who is God, is taking His Word, hiding your heart, and living it. How do you love God with all your heart? The first greatest commandment. By taking His Word, hiding it in your heart, and living it. Your love for God's Word. The truth. Absolute truth. Hiding in your heart and living it. Matthew 13, 19. The parable of the sower. Now I believe this is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. It was talking about, Jesus was talking about in His time period. Where the prophecies were there. And He came, John the Baptist came and preaching. And He came and preaching and Satan would come. The so if you've ever heard the parable of the sower, and I believe he's talking primarily of the time of Jacob's trouble. But the instruction righteousness is, this is how Satan works in any dispensation. We heard it back in Adam and Eve in, in Genesis. Yea, hath God said. That's how he always works. He tries to take God's word away. That's how Satan's always worked. That's his M.O. Matthew 13, 9. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom... And it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. Brothers and sisters of Christ, the reason I keep pointing this out, all right, and I'll say this again, my saying is this. This book is always... You remember that whole saying my grandfather? That's, that's, I'm going to take it back a step. My grandfather used to joke around about, about the golden rule. There's two golden rules. And rule number one is, is I'm always right. And rule number two is, is if I'm wrong, refer to rule number one. And it was a joke. He never, he wasn't actually saying I'm always right. But it was one of those jokes that you see. But it was an actual saying. And some people actually live up to it. They actually believe it. But the real rule is this. God, through His perfect written word, the King James Bible, this book right here, is always right. Always right. And when this man right here is wrong, or any other man out there that's preaching and teaching, when this man is wrong, refer to rule number one. This book is always right. I can be wrong. I am, I am flawed still. In the sense that uh, we're still in this wicked body of flesh. I can get distracted by the world. Okay, I can make mistakes. I get tempted just like you, brothers and sisters of Christ. But this book is always right. It is always right. But what does Satan do? 
He tries to keep you from truly loving God with all your heart. How does he do that? He snatches the word of God away. The true plan of salvation. He's got people out, his minions out there attacking the true gospel in the King James Bible. He's got his minions out there attacking the real Jesus Christ, the King James Bible. He's got his minions out there attacking final authority that there is no perfect written word of God. Why? He's trying to get God's word away from anybody and everybody. Now you truly get saved and born again, what does Satan do? He tries to get you to do this. Every day he's trying sometimes. Not Satan himself, but the temptation of the three enemies. The flesh, the world, Satan. They're trying to get you to close this book and put it away. Oh, you've read it enough. Come on, you can take some time off. Oh, come on, just, you know, it's not that big of a deal. What, why are you starting the day with the word? Come on, you did that the last 20 days. Come on, you can get skipped one day. Come on. That's, Satan's, that's what Satan's always doing. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And here it is. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Why does he transform himself into an angel of light? Because Jesus in the Old Testament was the angel of the Lord. And when Jesus comes, he says, I am the light of the world. So what is uh, 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 Satan doing today? That Antichrist spirit? He's coming as a false Christ. He's posing as a false Jesus Christ. And the world's buying it. Hook, line, and sinker. The easy believism. All these false religions that profess a Jesus Christ, they're all worshiping Satan. They're all worshiping Satan. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness. What that's talking about is these, these Satanists that are doing animal sacrifice and pentagrams and all this stuff, which they call it witchcraft, but... You know, this it's Satanism and everything. Those are God are Satan's, you know, ministers. No, they're not. Satan's ministers are gonna be in a nice suit and tie in these Babel buildings, in organized religions that claim a Christianity. Those are where Satan's true ministers are. Infiltrating everything. Anytime the Bible true Bible believing, God fearing, King James Bible tries to do a movement to try to bring people to salvation to true saving grace and try to do good works of the God, of the Lord, Satan comes in and infiltrates it. His ministers come in and start infiltrating it and start destroying it. And we're seeing that in the last days. We're scattered. We're scattered to the wind, brother, says Christ. Just scattered to the wind. Second Peter 2.2 2. I remember, oh, I left the part out where it says, and their end shall be according to their works. They're lost. They're not saved. My end is not according to my works, praise God. My reward's in heaven. How I get to spend eternity with my Lord and Savior is based off my works. Whole another study. But why works are so important? Maybe we'll do a study on that. We've already talked about it, but we might do it again. Why are good works so important? Because how you're going to spend eternity matters. Not just getting to spend eternity, but how you're going to spend eternity with our Lord and Savior. The rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay. But these guys, their salvation, where they're going to spend eternity is determined on their works. Because they're lost. 2 Peter 2.2 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Evil spoken of. I believe by the time you get into chapter 2, uh, 2 Peter, it's getting into the time of Jacob's trouble. Talk about they're really going to be attacking this book, probably doing book burnings, attacking this book, attacking anybody that has the King James Bible. Right, when you have the one world order, uh, the one world religion, one world currency, one world uh, economic system, you know, all that stuff, they're really going to be going after them. But for instruction righteousness, we see it today. Let the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. We just read about how this book is spiritually discerned. It takes the Holy Spirit. You know, being truly saved and born again to believe that this is God's perfect written word. Romans 1.28 Romans 1.28 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind against this book. Reprobate mind. To do those things which are not, which are not convenient, contrary to the Word of God. Being filled with all unrighteousness, contrary, that's, isn't that contrary to the Word of God? Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. As I'm reading this, are you falling under any of this? I'm talking about brethren that are backsliding, not lost people at, at this point. I'm talking to you, brothers and Christ. If you're starting to see that some of this might a little bit might apply to you, get your heart right with God. You're starting to backslide. Whispering. Okay? Talk about people behind their back, backbiters. Haters of God. Hopefully, I don't believe that's us, Brother Says Christ. But despiteful, but your actions. Sometimes I look at some of the mistakes I've made and I've fallen. It's not that I hated God, but my actions showed the world, well, you really don't love God that much. Because remember, what is loving God? The Lord looks at us and we're not keeping God's word. They don't see a person that really, truly loves God. And what's the opposite of loving God? It's hate. The opposite of love is hate. But this lost world, for people who attack this book, they're haters of God. Despiteful. Proud. That's a big one that this, I believe the body crisis. Body crisis um, struggling with whispering and backbiting. And proud. Boasters. Okay. We're struggling. We need to humble ourselves. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Not in pride. Not with hate and bitterness in your heart. With love in your heart for your brother and sister Christ. If you're correcting a lost person, trying to show them the true plan of salvation, you do it out of love. You do it with sternness. You can still say with authority. You can speak with authority. But don't do it with pride. Don't, be, don't have your foundation of correcting someone based off of bitterness and hate. Right. Inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. That's a big one we see today. Disobedient with parents. You're to honor your mother and father. If they go against this book, this book is, is the final authority. You obey this book. But don't dishonor them. And do you read in the Bible, how do you dishonor your parents? Uh, you know, uh, Esau. He dishonored his parents. And in the way he dishonored his parents, he married uh, women that, that his parents didn't approve. Okay. There's different ways you can dishonor your parents. 31, you can still obey this book and dishonor your parents is what I'm saying. There's ways to dishonor your parents even though you're trying to do your best to obey this book. You can still dishonor your parents. But this book comes first. It's not dishonoring your parents if the book says abstain from all, like my mom wants to go to movies. I'm sorry, I can't go to movies. I'm not dishonoring her by saying I'm not going and putting that wickedness before my eyes. Put no wickedness before thine eyes. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I don't want to watch that stuff. That's not dishonoring her. That's honoring God, and that's honoring her by being a light, saying, hey, if I'm not doing it because I'm pleasing God, and you profess to be a Christian, maybe you shouldn't be doing it either. Not maybe, you shouldn't be doing it either. But if I go out and I get drunk, that dishonors my parents in the sense that they're like, that's our son. And oh, I'm drunk, there, my mom and dad. In public, you can dishonor them. Verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, sodomites. Is sodomy a hardcore in America today? It's all over the world, but there's pastors out there that are claiming to be Christians that are sodomites. And now the big push today in this false religion, the easy believism, is that you can be a sodomite be a Christian. You can be saved in the sun without natural affection. No, this is a lost person. This is actually going through talking about lost people. People who reject the Word of God. They do not retain God in their knowledge. They're rejecting the Word of God. Without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful. What happened to having grace today more than anything? Would I hit you up, brothers and sisters Christ? Where's the grace for your brothers and sisters in Christ? 
as God has mercy on you and grace for you, where's your grace for your brothers and sisters in Christ? It seems today that that grace just seems to be all like a well that's all dried up. You have brethren that are struggling with uh, the flesh, struggling with the world. They're, str they're, 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 they're studying the Word of God and they're making mistakes in their studies. Where's the grace? Talk to them with love. Correct them with love. Do Bible studies with them. Unmerciful? That's the action I get a lot from the professing Christians that have to do with the easy believism and the Bible perversion crowd and obvious false religions, Catholicism and her daughters. Unmerciful. They're just unmerciful. When you start hitting, they start out with like love. Oh, God is love and we all need to hold hands and sing kumbaya. But the moment you put this in their face, that love vanishes and it just becomes unmerciful. They just have so much hate and bitterness towards you. Toward, it's towards the book. It seems like it's towards you, Brother Sis Christ, but it's towards the book. It's towards the real, true Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Verse 32, Who knowing the judgment of God, and they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You say, well, I don't do it, but I was addicted to Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, the sports industry, the music industry, commercials. Um, they're starting to put a lot of filth in our education system. You're not actually doing it, but it's there in front of you. Do you tolerate it? Or do you say, I don't want this at all in my home, or I don't want this junk around me at all? If you have it around you, and there's a lot of people, and it's easy believism, faith alone, that, well, I didn't actually do it, but I love watching it. I love seeing it, but I, you can't hold me accountable because I didn't actually do it. What did it just say there? Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Well, it was just a comedian making fun of it. He's making light of sin. He's making fun of God, but it's just a joke. You know, it's just a comedian. But you're taking pleasure in it. You're as guilty as he is in God's eyes. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, remember the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why did I go that far? Because brothers and sisters in Christ, the new birth, the changed life, God will bring someone into all truth and he'll bring them to the King James Bible, someone who truly gets saved and born again. They'll get this book and they'll start hiding it in their heart. And they'll start living it. Someone who's truly saved and born again. The new creature, the new birth, the new man. How do you love God with all your heart? How are we doing it, brothers and sisters Christ? And I pray we need to work, we need to work harder on it is we take God's Word and we hide it in our heart and we live it. Our love for God's perfect written Word. All right. So, this has been a little bit of a long one. Please, I'm grateful that those who have made it to the end have bared with me. Brothers and sisters Christ, the Word of God is under attack more and more. And Satan's working hard along with the world and enticing your flesh to try to get you to put the book down and brethren are not staying in the book as often as they should. I remember Peter Ruckman, he really hammered him. That's what I liked about Peter Ruckman. He had his mistakes, I have my flaws, but he'd always hammer him saying, you don't know this book like you should know this book. And I hammer myself, Lord, do I know this book as I, like I should know this book? And it motivates me to stay in this book even more. But this is Christ, do you know this book is like you ought to know this book? Are you staying in the Word of God? Uh, I let this out, but uh, Alexander Scorby. You can get Alexander Scorby, put it on a little recorder that has a speaker, and when you're working, you can listen to the Word of God being read while you're working. I, I sit outside, I work in the garden, I clean house, I, I listen to the Word of God, I listen to peaceful music, and I pray. Listening to the Word of God in prayer. Biggest things. Reading the Word of God, listening to the Word of God, and praying. Notice this, Christ. What is the, the greatest commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. How do we love the Lord thy God with all our heart? What's the evidence? We're living a life of Christ. Because loving the Lord is loving His Word. His Word. 
His fa this foundation. His way. God, I love your way. You get in the Psalms, David, King David sung about this a lot, that it's your word that matters. It's your way that matters, Lord. You are what matters, Lord. Not man's way, not man's words. You, O oh Lord. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and let's get back in these books, brothers and sisters of Christ.